Good morning, and welcome to the August edition of the Kauffman Fast Track Author Series. This is Alain Mueller, President of Kauffman Fast Track, and it's my pleasure to have you here today. Um, today, I'd love to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Gary Schoeniger. Gary is an author and entrepreneur. He's also an internationally recognized thought leader in the field of entrepreneurship education. Gary is the founder and CEO of the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative, or ELI, as it's known, an organization dedicated to providing interactive entrepreneurship education and training programs for individuals and organizations worldwide. Additionally, through a partnership with the Kauffman Foundation, Eli's Ice House Entrepreneurship Program has been widely embraced by educators and economic development organizations throughout the United States and across the globe. Gary is also the co-author of Who Owns the Ice House? Eight Life Lessons from an Unlikely Entrepreneur, an international bestseller once described as required reading for humanity. Please join me in welcoming Gary Schoeniger to the Kauffman Fast Track Author Series. Gary, welcome. Good morning, Alana. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So what I would like to do, Alana, talk a little bit about the background and how this book came to be, and then a little bit about some of the research we've uncovered, the sort of the state of entrepreneurship, some of the research we've uncovered over the last decade working with uh, uh, you all at the Kauffman Foundation and our partners at the Cisco Entrepreneur Institute. So um, let me just start out with a little brief history of my, my own entrepreneurial background. I became an entrepreneur out of necessity. Uh, I, I had been through after high school. I, had, I was not a great student. I want to put that out there. Um, as Dan Pink says, I was one of those students that made the top 90% possible. Let's just put it that way. So I had a series of meaningless, low-paying jobs uh, after high school and became increasingly in debt, uh, you know, behind on my bills, in debt, unemployed not really knowing what to do. And one day, literally out of desperation, I borrowed a ladder from a friend of mine and strapped it on the roof of my car and began going door to door, offering to clean the leaves out of people's gutters. And it was really this experience taught me how to be an entrepreneur. And I can now reverse engineer it. At the time, I did not realize that I was developing skills and pattern recognition and habits were happening. I was acquiring tacit knowledge that I did not know that I was acquiring. And so over the course of 20 years, my gutter cleaning business evolved to sort of a handyman fix it, remodeling, to becoming a home builder and a developer. I wound up with a partner who is an architect trained in Switzerland, and we wound up building very expensive high-end homes in Pittsburgh, Chicago, and Cleveland. This is a picture of the last house that I built for a client in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. So that's just a brief history of my own entrepreneurial journey, and I don't want to uh, delve into that, only to say that through that experience, I realized that entrepreneurs look at the world differently. And if I could somehow understand and articulate those differences, that could empower people. There's something to it. I initially rejected the idea that it was some kind of mystical DNA or, or you know, a mystery, that there was somehow there was a logic and reason behind entrepreneurial thinking. And I, that set me on a path to understand it that brought me here today. But something kind of miraculous happened along the way. Uh, as I was evolving and building this home building and development company, I wound up adopting a young man named Jason. He was 12 years old when I met him. I was a single dad at the time with two small boys, joint custody of my own boys, Sam and Owen. And uh, I met Jason when he was 12. He's about four or five years older than my own boys. And he was in his fourth foster home. His mom was in prison. He never knew a father. Bright young kid. 
and uh, I, I had some influence over him. I began to take him to construction sites with me, uh, bring him to family dinners, you know, take him to work on the weekends, and just sort of big brother mentoring this, this young kid. When he was 16 years old, when he was about 15, he went back to live with his mother. She was released from prison. He went back to live with his mom for a short period of time. He was enrolled in high school, not doing well in high school at all. And about halfway through his junior year, he dropped out of high school when his mother reoffended and went back to prison. The time he was working as a dishwasher in a, in a fast food restaurant uh, or a restaurant chain, and he had a 1.7 grade point average, dropped out of high school, and he called me and explained to me that, uh, you know, they would give him full-time work where he was working, and he'll get a GED later, and uh, he would get his GED later, and, and, and this was, he was going to get his own apartment, and this was sort of his his vision for the, the near-term future for himself. And I convinced him that this was a movie that had already been made, we know how it ends, it's not well, and that he should let me have custody of him, which after some talking he reluctantly agreed to this. I got him enrolled in high school, got a judge to give me custody of him, moved him in our house, and I got him a job with a friend of mine, minimum wage job sweeping construction sites. And so after a few weeks of this job, maybe a month, he came to me one day and he said, I really don't like this job. You know, you're always talking about entrepreneurs. Why don't you help me start my own business? Now, I, I want to back up for a minute and remind you that uh, I had been studying entrepreneurs, interviewing entrepreneurs, reading biographies of entrepreneurs. Every you know, waking minute of my life practically, I became obsessed with this. And I always had this idea that entrepreneurship was some form of empowerment. I never imagined in my wildest dream that my first opportunity to test these ideas would be on a 16-year-old kid that had six months of washing dishes, six weeks of sweeping construction sites on his resume, a high school dropout with a 1.7 GPA. This was my first test case. So I said, what do you know how to do? You know how to clean construction sites and wash dishes. Well, I had, an, I had a, a theory that construction companies would pay you know, a reasonable $20, $25 an hour for on-demand cleaning services. And so what I did with Jason, I said, how can we test this idea quickly and easily without going into, you know, in-depth planning and asking a bank for money and so forth? We made a flyer. I gave him a shop back, a broom, a bucket with some gloves and some trash bags in it. Go find a client and charge them 20 bucks an hour and clean their construction sites for them. And there were a lot of fits and starts. What I now realize is that I was asking Jason to behave in a way that was completely counter to his self-concept. And I now realize this is the barrier for most. I was asking him to behave in a way that just didn't jive with his schema with his view of the world and where he fit in. So I pushed him out of his comfort zone. And every time he got turned down, he would call me and want to lower the price. And he wanted to go to $6 an hour because that's where he was comfortable and familiar. So after several rejections, his energy levels going down, finally he finds a client. Now I just tell him, do a very good job. Do a 10% more than a reasonable man would expect, which he did. It led to another job and another job and another job, and pretty soon his phone is ringing. He's got his friends helping him, and he's figured out how to earn $300 in a single day on a Saturday with his own little side business. So that was really the first person I had a chance to teach entrepreneurship to. I knew that it had 
impacted his life. But I had evidence in my hand one day, about a month after he graduated high school, he went into the Marine Corps, he signed up for the Marine, he was off at Paris Island, and I got this package in the mail from the White House. And I tore it open. It was a leather-bound certificate of academic achievement made out to Jason Lee Campbell, and it was signed by the President of the United States. And now I was holding in my hand evidence that an entrepreneurial experience can empower people. So, it, you know, I'll just tell you today for a little bit of bragging rights, Jason served two tours of duty in Iraq as a reconnaissance Marine. He came back on his GI Bill, went to San Francisco State University where he graduated with honors with a degree in foreign relations and economic development. He's now serving in a consulting capacity to, to, uh, in Afghanistan. So that's kind of the update where Jason is at this moment in time. The, this experience led to an invitation to teach at a local high school. This gave me the chance to test this on a larger sample because honestly, I thought Jason must have been some kind of an anomaly. So when I was invited to teach entrepreneurship at a local high school, I jumped at the chance because I thought I could test this on a larger sample. Essentially got very similar results. Started getting phone calls from parents. Hey, what are you guys giving away over there? I couldn't get my kid out of bed in the morning, and now she can't wait to go to school an hour early. We made him come to class an hour before school to attend our class. So. That high school experience led to a contract with the Cisco Entrepreneur Institute to help them develop content. The Cisco was developing the Entrepreneur Institute to help small and medium enterprise grow um, in, in emerging markets, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Asia. And they hired us to create content. They also hired us to do a gap analysis on the entrepreneurship education ecosystem. And it was that experience that gave us a platform to not only delve into the entrepreneurship education ecosystem, but to interview entrepreneurs all over the United States on camera. That was a fascinating experience. Hundreds of on-camera interviews with what I'll call everyday entrepreneurs. I'm not so interested in the Silicon Valley, you know, the usual suspects that came up with an idea, got funded, and you know, now they're Mark Zuckerberg or Google or whatever. I'm more interested in the process and the mindset of an everyday entrepreneur. So in this journey, in this discovery process, uh, we were in Tulsa, Oklahoma to interview a blind man named Jim Stovall who started a television company for blind people after he went blind at the age of 29. He started a company called Narrative Television Network uh, for blind folks. It's an amazing story. We got this interview. Uh, you know, we were done by noon. We weren't leaving till the next day. I said to my crew, why don't we try to find some other entrepreneurs while we're here in Tulsa, Oklahoma? And so we started asking perfect strangers in a coffee shop, do you know any entrepreneurs? And when the second person said to me, you ought to talk to this guy named Clifton Talbert, I said, all right, who's Clifton Talbert? What, you know, what, it, what did he do? How can I get a hold of him? They said, well, he's one of the founders of the Stairmaster Exercise Company. And I said, well, that's an interesting story. Can you get me in touch with uh, Mr. Talbert? Yes, here's his phone. Called him on the phone. I explained to him what we were doing. We're interviewing entrepreneurs for the Cisco Entrepreneur Institute. And, uh, you know, would you be open to an, an interview this afternoon? We're only in Tulsa for the rest of today. 
He agreed to the interview. Two or three hours later, we showed up with a film crew in his office. And it was funny because he forgot what he agreed to. We showed up three hours later with all this equipment. And, and you know, he said, wait a minute, who are you and what did I agree to? So I knew nothing about him. He knew nothing about us. This was arranged in a, you know, on the fly. Got in his office, introduced myself, sat him down in the corner with a camera and lights and a crew. And one of the first questions I asked him was, how did you learn how to start a company like Stairmaster? I mean, did you go to college to be an entrepreneur? How did you learn to be an entrepreneur? And what he explained to me was that he, like Jason, was born into a poor family. And, and Clifton was born in the 1940s in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, uh, he was born to a teenage mother, didn't know a father. And like he explained to me, like most people in that era, uh, the work was in the fields. And the field truck came every morning at 6 a.m. You got on the field truck. They put you out and you gave you your rows and you filled up a sack with cotton and they paid you for the sack of cotton. And that was it. That was the expected way of life, as Cliff put it, that had been handed down to him. And he said, like everybody else, since he was about five or six years old, he was working in the cotton fields. And he said, at the age of 13, his uncle Cleve Mormon, who happened to own the local ice house, invited young Cliff Talbert to come and work beside him at the ice house. And, and Clifton began to describe this guy through the eyes. And Clifton's a master storyteller. He began to describe his uncle. And I watched, I can post this video and show it to you. It's on our, our, our website, the first two or three minutes of this interview. I still get goosebumps when I watch it because you can see this, this warmth and this smile come across Clifton's face as he's recalling his uncle. And he begins to describe how his uncle was different. And he said, I was a little boy. And he said, people in my community didn't go to the bank. We weren't allowed in the bank. They weren't welcome in the bank. There was no sense in banking. We didn't have anything to put in the bank. And he said, my uncle was the only guy that put money in the bank. And Clifton said to me that, you know, every week or every two weeks on Friday, they would drive into Greenville in Mississippi, and they would go in the bank. And he described it through the eyes of a 13-year-old boy, like observing this behavior that was different. And he said, you know, my uncle walked differently. He, he drove the speed limit, but he had a twinkle in his eye, and he was always looking on the horizon. There was just something about his posture, about his demeanor. He said, we weren't allowed to go in the front door of the bank. We had to go in the back door. And I watched my uncle pull the passbook out of his bib overalls and slide it under the counter, and the teller would give it back to him, and, and out they would go. So as Clifton was describing his uncle, and the lessons that his uncle was teaching him, I began to realize that the same lessons Uncle Cleve was teaching Clifton in 1958 in Glen Allen, Mississippi, were essentially the same core concepts that all these hundreds of entrepreneurs had been telling us. And what I realized is that at that moment, I, you know, I, I realized that you know, the, there's no real formula for becoming a successful entrepreneur. It's not formulaic. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not convergent like becoming a doctor or a teacher or an engineer. Yet I, I realized there's this fundamental logic that it's a mindset, if you will. There's this underlying logic, and it transcends circumstances, socioeconomics, time, culture. 
and, and this was the story I had really been looking for to convey the message that I was trying to convey. And that is simply this. The essence of entrepreneurship is solving problems for other people. And what the story from the Ice House and these eight life lessons convey is that it really doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter what you have to work with or where you came from. You can empower yourself by solving problems for other people. That is the simple core message from the book that we wanted to convey in this book. As I said, Clifton is a master storyteller. So the way with that we structured the book is Clifton will talk about a chapter in his life and his interaction as a young boy with Uncle Cleve. And I'm so, so Clifton's providing the narrative and I'm offering sort of the entrepreneurial analysis. We really wanted to use this book to get people to think differently about entrepreneurship. And you know, one of the first things Clifton said to me in the interview was this idea that long before the, con the word entrepreneur became popular, the concept still existed. So that's just really a brief background of you know, why, how I came to know Cliff Talbert, why we chose this story as the vessel to convey a message that entrepreneurship is a mindset and it's a mindset that can, that can empower anyone. It can empower ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's the basic background on the book. Uh, I can tell you it's been very widely embraced. It's being translated into Spanish. It's on the bestseller list. We've had offers to translate it into Korean and uh, 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 Portuguese. Um, it, it's really, it's really the, the arrow is landing where we intended it to land. I'm very uh, pleased with that. So in the second part of this talk, what I would like to do is share some of our research that we've uncovered about entrepreneurship, redefining entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, very excited to share some of this with you. I believe as a result of, of, of this work that we've done over the last decade that uh, uh, entrepreneurship is no longer an option. It, it's a necessity and that entrepreneurial skills are required for anyone to succeed in the 21st century. So I'd like to just briefly share with you some of this background uh, research that we've come up with. So to start with, you know, we all understand the entrepreneurial imperative, the need to encourage and support entrepreneurial activities at all levels of our society. This book was written by Carl Schramm, the former president of the Kaufman Foundation. I read this book before I ever met anyone at Kaufman. It was this book that gave me the courage to, to launch this business, the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. It's a great read, uh, very much validated a lot of our assumptions. So we all understand the importance of entrepreneurship, but how do we define it in a meaningful way that will enable us to support and nurture entrepreneurship at all levels of our society? In the past, we essentially we looked at entrepreneurs as if they were mavericks or fringe players who bucked the system. And we essentially ignored their abilities. The thriving industrial economy renders entrepreneurship essentially irrelevant as a field of study. Even to this day, we tend to look at entrepreneurs as if they're larger than life figures. The Richard Branson, Henry Ford, Bill Gates, Sam Walton, whatever. They're larger than life figures with some sort of unique abilities. 
a famous economist from the University of Chicago once declared their decision-making process was a scientifically unfathomable mystery. So there's good reason that we don't have clarity around entrepreneurship. Essentially, we've ignored it for much of the last century. Today, entrepreneurs have become the engines that are driving our economies. In fact, Kaufman just published some research showing that entrepreneurs are responsible for all net new job growth. Policymakers are beginning to understand the broader implications of entrepreneurship beyond just this current understanding of the Silicon Valley narrative. Uh, they're beginning to understand the power and the implication of supporting entrepreneurship at all levels of our society. The fact remains that entrepreneurship is not well understood. We know a lot about the inner workings of large established corporations. We know a lot about how to manage an existing business. The entrepreneurial process is still much a mystery to most. It's still not well understood. So for, for many, the word entrepreneur conjures the image of the high growth entrepreneur. And as I'm fond of saying, this is sort of the Silicon Valley narrative is hijacked the conversation around entrepreneurship. But this sort of Silicon Valley uh, a high growth entrepreneur uh, leads to curriculum that looks like this, what I'll call a plan and pitch approach. Typically a technology centric bias. Students are asked to come up with ideas with obvious high growth potential, develop a business plan, conduct in-depth market research, complete with financial projections and investor presentations. So, and I'm speaking generally here, but this is sort of the, 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 the high growth uh, version of entrepreneurship. Now, I want to be clear. A high growth entrepreneurship is very important. High growth entrepreneurs make a tremendous contribution to our economies. The problem is it's just not representative of what a typical entrepreneur undertakes. What we found is that of the 600,000 or so new businesses that are created each year in the U.S., less than 2% re receive institutional investment at their beginning. In fact, Kaufman just published some research showing that 0.18 of 1% receive venture capital at their inception. If you put in organized angel financing on top of it, it's still less than 2%. So to summarize, the high growth entrepreneur is important. It's just not representative of the process, the mindset, and the skills that a typical entrepreneur will undertake. So a lot of people also confuse entrepreneurship with small business management. They tend to toss about these terms interchangeably. They tend to treat a startup as if it were simply a smaller version of a large company. And that leads to curriculum that looks something like this. Those who want to start a business are encouraged to conduct market research, write a business plan, learn about finance and accounting, marketing and sales, legal structures, and you know, how to pursue bank financing. My point here is that entrepreneurship is not management. And while those skills are very important for managing an existing business with customers and cash flow, a known product and a known service, they're not all that helpful when it comes to identifying and evaluating new opportunities. So, while the image of the high growth entrepreneur might captivate our imagination, when we look at the research, a very different picture begins to emerge. And this picture real, reveals a disconnection between what we are currently teaching and what entrepreneurs 
are actually doing. So I'll point to one study in particular conducted by a man named Amer Bidet, who was uh, at Harvard at the time he conducted this research, looking at several hundred Inc. 500 companies. He found that carefully planned venture-backed startups are by far the exception rather than the rule. So he created this profile looking at several hundred successful companies. And he created this startup profile, and it looks like this. What he found was that these companies were not founded on breakthrough innovations or new technology. He found that the entrepreneurs themselves were doing little or no formal planning. He found that the research was ad hoc rather than in depth. He also found that the median startup capital for an Inc. 500 company was $10,000. And it wasn't coming from institutional investors, it was coming from credit cards, second mortgages, friends, fools, and family. Perhaps most astonishing of all, he found that the founders themselves had little or no experience in their chosen field. In fact, 40% had no experience at all. Now I'm asking you, you all that, who are on this webinar today, to look at this profile. It seems to defy gravity. It seems to turn common sense and logic completely upside down. I would further add that when we look at this profile, we can see how this perpetuates the mythology that when you look at this, you can say, oh my goodness, of course these entrepreneurs are mystical and they've got some magical, some scientifically unfathomable abilities. How the heck do they do this? No new technology, no planning, ad hoc market research, a few thousand dollars and little or no experience. How do they turn that into a company? So, I would also like to add that these were not mom and pop companies. Included in his startup in this survey was Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Walmart, and Waste Management. So the conclusion of this study is that even large established companies have humble improvised origins. And even entrepreneurs like Sam Walton and Bill Gates initially set out pursuing highly uncertain niche opportunities that are obvious to no one, without access to capital, without much planning and research, and without much experience. And what we know is that they learn to survive with skills, the entrepreneurial skills that are different from managerial skills. That's really the important point here, and I want to dive a little deeper on this, if you'll allow me. So to, to better illustrate this point, I'm going to borrow from this concept called transformation theory developed by a guy named George Land. Transformation theory is designed to explain the nature of change within any natural system. So that could be a, an organism, an animal in the wild, a human being, a company, a country, a culture, an organization, what have you, any system. And what Dr. Land is saying that there are these three separate phases of life, of growth. They're unavoidable. And each of these three phases is interrupted by a breakpoint. And the breakpoint represents a moment in time or a period in time, I should say, because it's not you know, cut and dry. But it's a moment in time when the rules for survival change. So those are called breakpoints. So this first phase, we can call this the search phase. This is where the system is searching to make a connection with its environment. If you want to think of this in a purely biological 
as a, as a purely biological analogy. The system is searching to make a connection with its environment. That's how we characterize this first phase. And it, it's here that I'd like to point out that as human beings, the way we connect with our environment is by creating something useful. It, it's really just that simple. This is the essence of entrepreneurial thinking. And, and I've been thinking about and studying uh, the entrepreneurial mindset and thought process for almost 20 years. And I, I think one of the bedrock, one of the foundational assumptions of the entrepreneur is that it's up to me to create something useful. Now this is a conversation that's largely absent from uh, uh, the way most of us are trained to think. We're trained to think in a different way. But let's just stay focused here on this search process, right? So if we're, 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 we're an entrepreneur, we're searching to find that intersection between what we know how to do, what we care about, what we like to do, and the needs of other people. That's the essence of entrepreneurial thinking. So how do we know when we've reached this break point? Generally speaking, we measure usefulness with some form of currency. In most societies, that's how we measure usefulness. And I just want to point this out because people rarely behave as we predict. People rarely behave as they say they will behave. It's when they pay for something that we sort of have some kind of validation that it is, in fact, useful. So this search for this connection is, is the entrepreneurial phase. And I would like to point out as the research shows, that this phase is typically, this search process is typically conducted in an environment with lots of uncertainty and very limited resources. So the yellow tower is uncertainty, the little green nub is resources. Lots of uncertainty, limited resources. We're searching for that connection. We're searching for the connection between what we know how to do, like to do, care about, are capable of doing, and the needs of our fellow humans. The rules for survival here require interaction and observation, experimentation and adaptation. Naivete, that the system doesn't know what it doesn't know. 16-year-old Bill Gates can see something that the brain trust at IBM cannot. It requires curiosity and creativity, the willingness to experiment and try new things. It requires critical thinking, requires effective problem solving, and it requires the system to be fully engaged. In many cases, this search is existential. If not existential, it's purpose-driven. There's an internal locus of control. We're searching for something that has meaning for us. So at some point, the system makes this connection. As an entrepreneur, we know we're making this connection when people begin to buy whatever it is we're selling. Now we're starting to know who is buying, why they're buying, where they're coming from. The connection is found. The system must stop searching and begin to replicate the success it has found. So now the system stops the search process. It's reached this break point. Now it goes into a phase of replication. In order for the system to grow, it must replicate the success that it has found. This requires planning, process, procedures, efficiency, and improvement. It's formulaic. We do the same things over and over again. It requires deep knowledge. We start to know a lot about certain aspects of our customers and our business. It also requires a workforce that's compliant, that will conform, that will, uh, that will 
is governed by policies and procedures in order for the system to grow. So again, invariably the environment changes. But what I'd like to point out is that the, the, the resource and uncertainty paradigm is changing. We're starting to know more and more about the customer, who they are, why they're buying. So the uncertainty is coming down and the resource access is coming up. I would also add that for the many of the people who work within the system, and it's a replication system, the motivation is external rather than internal. The locus of control is external. So, you know, Gallup, for example, just published a study showing 71% of workers are actively disengaged in their work. It's just that the motivation is different in phase two. Again, I'm generalizing here. So invariably, a second breakpoint occurs. So what happens is the environment changes and the system starts to move into obsolescence. The environment is changing usually due to circumstances beyond our control. And the replication system starts becoming less effective as we move into this third phase. These changes can be brought about by new technology increase, competition, shrinking relevance, commoditization, scarcity of resources, regulatory changes. A few examples, the system changes. Ideally, the system recognizes the change and becomes open to new ideas and innovation. Problem is, in many cases, these changes are met with entrenched systems. Everybody in the organization knows that the ship is going down or that the environment has changed, but they're all somehow powerless to change it. Change is met by outdated assumptions, arrogance and denial. The tendency to, you know, the assumption of complete knowledge, Kodak, right, we're the film people. Denial, just flat out denial that, that, that you know, denying the changes that are happening. If these circumstances persist, the system will perish. So ideally, the system will become open to change, will recognize the change, and a new S-curve will begin as the system becomes open to change and open to new ideas that it explicitly rejected in phase two. So it's also important to point out that in this third phase, the system has experienced growth, and it now has access to resources, and it's grown. The uncertainty has been reduced. The system can no longer afford to pursue niche, uncertain opportunities. It has to pursue bold, well-planned, very carefully calculated bets. And it uses all of its vast resources to do this. They have a brand, they have channels, they have marketers, uh, research and engineers, you know, sales, all kinds of, of, of resources and, and experienced, knowledgeable people who will work in concert to pursue these large, bold, calculated bets. So I want to point out that that's a very different way of thinking. The rules for survival there are very different than they are for the entrepreneur. So in closing, what I want to say is, this is where we spent much of the last century. This is where our focus has been. That, and we expected to work in systems that were built on these theories. We expected to be governed by policies and procedures. We expected that we, uh, uh, our, our system of education was designed to create a workforce that would fit within this system. What I'm saying is that it is essential that we recognize that the environment has changed and that the rules for survival have also changed. 
and that within this resource constrained ambiguous environment is the environment that will help people develop curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, and other essential 21st century skills. So to wrap this up, what I just wanted to close with is my, one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, we can't solve this problem with the same thinking we use when we created them. We cannot build entrepreneurship on the foundation, on the ruins of the industrial economy. It just won't work. So we're defining entrepreneurship very simply as the opportunity discovery process. And it's a process, it's just that search process. And if we can shift the conversation and help every young person understand that it's up to them to do something useful, to find that intersection between what they know how to do, care about, like to do, and the needs of other people. You know, the idea of do what you love and the money will follow is not quite accurate. It's do what you love and figure out how to solve problems for other people with what you love and the money will follow. So when we look at entrepreneurship as simply a search process, the search process that is, process that is optimized in a resource constrained, ambiguous environment, when we understand it like that, this makes all the sense in the world. We, can no, we no longer have to look at entrepreneurs as if they're mystical figures with some magical DNA or, 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 or mystical abilities. Entrepreneurship is the opportunity discovery process. It starts with a mindset. It doesn't require access to venture capital. It doesn't require an MBA. It doesn't require years of experience and breakthrough technology. It requires a mindset. And it's a, it's a mindset that anybody can embrace. It's simply a search mindset. So that's basically the background. That's, what we, that's the, uh, uh, sort of the underpinnings of the Ice House Entrepreneurship Program. We designed this program to, to help facilitate this search process, to engage a broad range of students in these fundamental concepts of entrepreneurial thinking while immersing them in real world, resource constrained, ambiguous circumstances that will help them develop entrepreneurial skills. So that's my story for today. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to all of you. I'm, I'm honored, Alana, that you would ask me to do this, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Gary, thank you. That fabulous talk. Thank you so much. We do have a number of questions that I'd love to um, share with you and see what your thoughts are. Uh, the first question asks, how can, we, how can we learn to better evaluate entrepreneurial opportunities? So we use this process, uh, or drawing from Osterwalder's work, like a business model canvas. We call it an opportunity discovery canvas. We've stripped out all the business high-tech bias, business vernacular. Basically, use this canvas process Alana, I refer to it as a semi-sophisticated cocktail napkin. Document some basic assumptions on this canvas. What's your idea? What problem is it solving? What solutions currently exist? How is yours different? And you know, some basic assumptions and then get out of the classroom, get out of the building and start talking to people to see if you do in fact have a real problem solution fit. This is sort of the planning that comes before the planning, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very helpful. Very helpful. The, the next question is, what's the best way to commercialize an idea? Boy, Alana, that's, <laughs> that, that's a big question. <laughs> But the first part of that is that first phase. And I, I can't, there's, there's no way I can answer that 
with any degree of accuracy. It's a very broad question. There are you know, myriad ways to commercialize uh, ideas. But, but I will take this opportunity to say, um, you know, one of the big misnomers in entrepreneurial realm is that the idea is an epiphany followed by a business plan or somebody, you know, customers all of a sudden, you know, you're rich, like a get-rich-quick scheme. And, and that's really not the case. Again, when we look at research, the ideas become obvious over time. And they don't become obvious by more and more research done on Google. They become obvious as the entrepreneur is out in the marketplace scratching away at the opportunity. Sam Walton opened his first discount variety store in 1946. It was 1969 when he opened his first distribution center. So what Ice House is designed to do is to get you through this identification validation process fairly quickly. To, to see if you actually have a problem solution fit. If you have something people will pay you for before you make the big capital expense, you know, borrowing money and buildings and equipment and so on and so forth. That's great. Thank you, Gary. There, there's another question that takes us back to the model that you share. And the, the request is, can you talk a little bit more about how to uh, recognize the breakpoint between replication and obsolescence? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a really, that's a really good question. Difficult. Uh, um, you know, where do we see this in other areas of life, right? The 50-year-old that is complaining about, you know, new technology and changes but isn't updating his skills. Right? And again, I said this earlier, the breakpoint isn't always obvious. But it's not always obvious. But we need to be looking for these changes. And more importantly, Alana, I think it's more important to recognize that change is inevitable. Shift happens. Yep. <laughs> and that it's up to us to adapt. Right? It's up to us. The onus is on us to create something useful. I think that's the important point. And if, you know, if I'm out there in the world and I'm selling something or I'm working at a company or whatever, my skills are becoming less and less relevant. I notice younger people are getting passed over, you know, passing over me. That's an indication that you're going into obsolescence. That's great. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in, and, and it asks this, and, I, and uh, this is my editorial, I think kind of going back to Jason's story, the question is this, what are you finding in the public school systems that are not focused on impoverished and disenfranchised kids? What about girls' schools and those with middle class students, for example, in Tulsa? So I, I, I can't speak to the Tulsa school system specifically. We've done a few pilots in Tulsa. A public high school with Ice House program. Uh, um, but what I'm going to come back to is, you know, generally speaking now, we're looking at, uh, in the academic realm, we're looking at entrepreneurs like they're outliers still. We haven't quite figured out yet that this is a mind, that the environment has changed. And job readiness may not be the framework for thinking as we push students you know, the, the, in, in, through school, that, that we've got to shift this perspective uh, about entrepreneurial skills. And, and Alana, you, you know, this is a really good question. And, and the big clash is you know, phase two was another way of saying the industrial era in the US. It's predicated on management, on processes and replication. It requires compliance. That's the water we swim in. That's the air we breathe. These are tacit assumptions that are baked in to our current form of education. 
and we have we have to move if we want to shift students into a discovery mode we have to understand discovery requires us not to give them answers but the ambiguity is they're our friend we need to take away the resources and push them out into these real world resource constrained circumstances where they can learn to figure it out for themselves. I mean, let's face facts, all of human knowledge is available on a smartphone. That's perhaps the most that's perhaps the most exciting aspect of entrepreneurial thinking, Alana, is that it fosters this internal locus of control which 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 uh, 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 manifests itself as a lifelong self-directed learner. Again, phase one, the locus of control is internal. Phase two, the locus of control is external. Dan Pink would say it's carrot and stick. Absolutely. Um, another kind of big question, a little bit esoteric, but if everybody becomes an entrepreneur, who will be the workers? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I've heard that before. Um, it's an interesting commentary. I don't think we're in danger of, of that ever happening. So we just have to be more entrepreneurial. And Alana, what I've come to realize is that the impulse to be entrepreneurial resides in most human beings. And I, I've also come to believe that that impulse has nothing to do with business. Business sort of becomes the conduit for the expression. Most people have a desire to be engaged in work that matters, that has purpose, where they have a say, where they have some influence and where they have hope for something more and better, where their life isn't controlled by somebody else's decision. That's entrepreneurial. Yeah, and I'm saying, yeah, you can be entrepreneurial in whatever capacity. That's right. In fact, we, we say a lot, we talk about intrapreneurship, and so that if, if you're not the person with the idea, or you're not the owner of the company, you can still behave in an entrepreneurial way for somebody else's company. You know, I've got an intern in our office that's worked here for the summer, a student from Kent State University about to graduate with a degree in entrepreneurship. Bright young guy. He's got good ideas. I listen to his ideas. They're not all good. But I'm assuming that his naivete is an advantage. And I try to create a work environment that lets him have ownership of ideas and a voice. The end of the day, Alana, entrepreneurial thinking is a framework that will provide greater access to human potential. And back to the earlier question, you know, the assumptions underneath the question are predicated upon hierarchy. And and I think, you know, Entrepreneurship moves us from a command and control framework of thinking to a connect and collaborate way of thinking. Again, yeah, well, an overgen overgeneralization, but well said. Though I, I, I like that, um, Gary. We have about one minute left. Several of our participants are asking how they can bring the Ice House Entrepreneurial Program to their cities or to their communities. Can you just tell people where to go to learn about Ice House? Yes, yes, yes. Who owns the icehouse.com? That's a very simple program. The course materials come like any other textbook, a copy of the book, a workbook, and an online passcode. They can be, you know, distributed through a school bookstore, purchased through our online fulfillment center. The only requirement for an organization or a school to implement the program is send the facilitators through our two-day facilitator training at the Kaufman Foundation. We've trained nearly 500 teachers in 24 months from all over the world. We also have facilitator trainings available in, in Colombia, in England, in Eastern Europe, and uh, Malaysia. Terrific. That's great. Who Gary, the ice house? Th yeah. thank you so very much. It's just been a delight to have you here. Um, I can attest to the fact that uh, you're, you're a wonderful colleague to have and, and a great friend. And, and 
the information you shared really is so inspirational and informative. So very, very grateful for your time today. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate the opportunity. and Thank you all. You're welcome. Uh, for, for our participants, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month for our author series featuring Harry Campbell, who will talk about his book called Get Real Leadership. That event will take place on Wednesday, September 11th at 10 a.m. Central Time. You can learn more at fasttrack.org slash authors. And we look forward to talking with you next month. Everybody have a great day.